Good afternoon. I would like to welcome you all to our panel, Rosa Luxemburg and the Written Word. My name is Julia Killett. I'm the director of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation in Bavaria. Now, before we get started, I like to make a quick personal note. This conference is so great. I watched the German and international conference all day yesterday and today, and I'm amazed by all the speakers. Nevertheless, it's a great pity that we can't be together at the Volksbühne in Berlin. I hope we will meet again soon in person to celebrate Rosa Luxemburg. 150 years ago, Rosa Luxemburg was born. To mark the occasion, we have invited three excellent speakers. It's a great pleasure for me to spend the next two hours with you. Hey, everybody, I welcome you. <laughs> I would like to point out that we are live right now. So our viewers have the opportunity to ask questions in the comments column. We will come back to these questions after these presentations. The great Luxembourg academic Annelies Laschitza from the GDR, who sadly passed away shortly before the 100th anniversary of Rosa Luxemburg's death, once said to me, if you start researching Rosa Luxemburg, you will do so your whole life. With this idea in mind, I would like to ask my speakers to briefly express what Rosa Luxemburg means to them. Um, Dana, please start. Thank you so much, Julia, and thank you to everyone who's joining us today on this very special day. Rosa Luxemburg, for me, I agree with the statement that once you start reading her, you really can't stop. And I'm very, very lucky to know so many wonderful people through her and to get to know her writings. Rosa Luxemburg for me is a role model, an exemplar, a mentor in a way, and um, a guide of how to keep to integrity of social justice, even when you are under threat, sometimes from your own political side. So she has taught me how to stick to my ideas, even when things are hard. Thank you very much. And Kate? Um, well, as a cartoonist, um, the amazing thing about Rosa Luxemburg is she is, as a personality, she is larger than life. She, you know, like you have the Asterix comics and he's the indomitable ghoul, indomitable, yeah? Rosa Luxemburg is somebody who in life is indomitable. She just doesn't stop believing the things that she believes. Oh, I just want to take a message as well, moment as well to say um, it's really nice to be here. Um, and I just need to say as well that um, I have chronic illness and I also have the menopause. So if at some point I go like this, it's not that your Zoom froze, it's that my brain froze. OK, so I just want to make a disability awareness notice at the beginning here. <laughs> but yeah, I mean... Rosa Luxemburg was a gift to me because I didn't know very much about her at the point when I was commissioned to write the book um, and so she sort of like fell into my lap and the political and the artistic um, um, and, and the synchronicity of the events of her life with the events of her work um, resulted in such a kind of a richness of a biographic material that I don't think I can just sum it up in one sentence. Thank you very much. Um, Helen is not with us. Maybe she will come. We hope that she come. Um, and now I would like to turn to our topic, Rosa Luxemburg and the written word. Rosa Luxemburg was a scientist, journalist, theorist, and a brilliant orator, but she also loved classical literature. Now I want to introduce my first speaker, Dana Meitz, her talk will address what we can learn about Luxembourg as a reader and lover of culture for our own political engagement. Dana is a political theorist, lecturer, campaigner for socialist feminism and anti-racism. She is a dancer and the author of Dance and Politics as well as 
dance and activism, which, which is just available. Last year, she published her Luxembourg biography, Critical Lives. A warm welcome to you. I'm glad you could join us. Thank you so much. is not there, okay. And I would like to welcome Kate Evans. Kate is a radical cartoonist, artist, author, and activist. Her graphic novel about Rosa Luxemburg was published 2015 with the support of the New York office of the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation. The book was awarded Graphic Book of the Year by the Independent and the Observer newspapers in the UK and has been translated into 30 languages. Kate explain, Kate explain the process of creating the graphic biography of Rosa Luxemburg. You are very welcome. So, um, Helen is just not there, okay. Each speaker will have about 20 minutes each and after their presentations, we will have a discussion and take questions from our viewers. Let's begin with Dana Miles. Unfortunately, you have to leave us at 3.30 because you are giving a lecture at the Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, New York. Nevertheless, we are very happy that you can join us in this afternoon. The floor is yours, so to speak. Thank you very much, Julia. And um, I want to say something about my presentation today, which is a mix of some new research I'm doing on Rosa which, as I said, is um, a lifelong topic from now on, but also a reflection on the process of writing my own biography. And one thing I'm very grateful to be here today because your work, Julia, and your work, Kate, and Helen's work has been really, really influential on my reading of Rosa. So it's an honor and a joy to share today with you. My talk is termed, in itself, every book is something terribly unapproachable. Rosa Luxemburg culture and contradictions. On the day that Rosa Luxemburg met her untimely death, she was carrying a copy of Goethe's Faust, a book she loved and cherished all her life. These rhyming lines have been going around in my head since Easter, she wrote about Faust in 1917. Books and culture were a big part of Rosa Luxemburg's life and crucial for understanding the arc of her history and work. My own perspective, on Rosa Luxemburg is derived from specific questions that arose in the process of working on my own biography and critical study of interest and my general interests. Namely, much of the focus in my talk will be locating Rosa in Jewish cultural histories in which she is not widely read. In this talk, I shall try and examine what we can learn from Luxemburg's lifelong commitment to culture as an essential part of her life, if not always connected to her politics, about her life and her times. Specifically, I shall argue that we can find in Luxembourg's deep understanding of the spiritual and human needs that can be fulfilled by literature and culture about her Jewishness, as well as her ability to hold contradictions, yet live a life of integrity, even not if cohesive. This talk will start at a discussion of Rosa Luxemburg as a reader, proceed to a discussion of Rosa Luxemburg's own prose, and will conclude with thinking of the lessons Rosa's engagement with culture of the context of her biographer leave us today. Rosa Luxemburg is a reader. The end of the 19th century was a time of great revolutions, not only on the street, but also in the minds, studios, theaters, and within authors' studies. Modernism was bursting into the scene. Isadora Duncan was scandalizing Paris and London. Realism was giving way to modernism and abstract art of all forms. Ibsen was revolutionizing the stage. Puccini premiered his La Bohème in 1896, the same year in which Rosa made her own debut on the stage of the, of the Second International. Indeed, this opera's heroine gave Rosa's cat Mimi her name. Rosa's life was rich with opera and classical music. From Bach to Mozart, she especially loved The Marriage of Figaro. Against the backdrop of opera and classical music, more experimental approaches to tonality were arising, challenging what it is to be considered beautiful in music. Revolutions can take many shapes and forms, not all of them cohere to one long history, nor can they be easily reconciled within one person's psyche, as it will be shown. 
One overarching theme of this paper, which should be noted throughout, is that despite having political and ethical ideas which were forward-looking and transcended her immediate present, Rose of Luxembourg was by and large a cultural conservative. The canonical works to which she turned for solace throughout her life were hardly ever on the vanguard of cultural expression. Goethe, as I mentioned, was a favorite. So was Adam Mikiewicz, the great Polish poet, Shakespeare and Dickens. Nor was she a prophet of new trends and she never saw public position as crucial for developing them. It is interesting here to compare her to her contemporary Eleanor Marx, who was a cultural pioneer of Ibsen, then scandalous on the London stages, who took the family Bible, by the way, Karl Marx, her father taught himself English through reading Shakespeare, and took that to teaching the working classes about culture and how to revolutionize culture. Eleanor champ championed the work of her friend and comrade Amy Levy, whose portrayal of anti-Semitism and oppression speaks beyond its immediate context. We can learn much more about Eleanor Marx, who was an exact contemporary of Luxembourg and indeed met her in 1896 in Rachel Holmes's recent study, Eleanor Marx, A Life, which basically sets her place in cultural history much more firmly than she ever had been before. But returning to our birthday girl, Rosa Luxembourg, she provides us with a much more complex picture. Rosa Luxembourg was an unusual daughter of a white and rich culture, a world that is now gone. Jewish middle-class building, commonplace in Germany and beyond it within the realms of cultural influences, such as Poland, her homeland, Culture has always been an important gate and form of communication between Jewish subcultures in Europe and those countries in which people were debating between exceptionalism and assimilation. Besides the Bible and the Talmud, Goethe and Schiller happily stood. As Kafka would later put in his great novel, The Castle, middle-class Jews were often not of the castle and not of the village, neither completely assimilated nor completely separationist. The bookshelves were a living testimony of that tendency. In fact, Rosa reflected in a letter that her mother's second source of wisdom after the Bible was Schiller. Indeed, when I was writing Rosa's life, many of the references which appeared in Rosa's letters, footnotes and asides, resonated with the bookshelf of my own late Königsberg born grandmother. For many Jews, cultures, and especially culture which had been respected and treated as highbrow culture, was a gate into assimilated circles, a way to connect with their homelands which were, in which they were only partly their homelands and in which they were only partly citizens. Culture was a way to feel at home in the world, to be less of an outsider. It is clear that for Rosa, culture was there as a way to soothe and connect, not to challenge and radicalize. Her own tastes were anything but particular and relate to these general trends. I argue here that her attraction to these canonical German and Prussian texts are just as telling of her Jewishness, a woman always living on the outskirts of society, who through culture found a deep way to belong. In order to understand the cultural tastes which Rosa acquired from the Luxembourg family, it is necessary to look at the cultural histories of her specific time and place. The Haskalah movement was the Jewish Enlightenment movement, which influenced both the lives of Jews as cultures around them. Poland was an important hub of this movement. Indeed, Israel Zamoch was one of the most important forerunners of this movement. He, was, uh, he worked between 1700 th so to 72, and his last name reflects the Rosa's hometown, which he acquired by living there. Talmudist and mathematician, he gained his name from his residence at Zamoch. The Haskalah movement, as can be understood from its name, it translates literally in Hebrew as education, argued that education would be the way to bridge between Jewish institutions and modern life. Trying to balance connections to the world around them as well as to retain Jewish identity was the historical question haunting Jews and attempted to be answered by the Haskalah movement. Letter writing as a way to sustain connection between variety of Jewish hubs was a distinct feature of this movement. In terms of collective ethos and ideas, the Haskalah pushed towards anti-clerical legally governed and secularized approach to collective life. This movement is considered to have come to an end around the 1880s. Rosa Luxemburg was its clear child in many ways, whether she had chosen to relate to it or not. It is also worthwhile pausing here for further cultural context in which Luxemburg specifically lived her life. For instance, Isaac Leigh Peretz, who was also born in Zamoch, 
1852 and died in Warsaw in 1919, is considered one of the greatest Jewish writers of the 19th century. He was a family friend of the Luxembourgs, and his, although his ethos completely was opposite to the one that Rosa would live in, he rejected cultural universalism and gravitated towards Jewish particularism. I wanted to read to you a short poem by Peretz that he wrote in, in honor of Advent of Spring, which I thought for readers of Luxembourg would resonate with a lot of themes, but is also very much appropriate as a birthday poem. Hope the spring won't lag much longer. Butterflies will come in throngs. There'll be new nests on the branches and new birds will sing new songs. Trust that night will soon be over and the clouds will vanish too. Blue ones more will be in the heavens. Stars and suns all fresh or new. Spring's sweet breath will rouse new roses. Flowers will shoot up bright and brave. They'll be shining, singing fragrance everywhere and on our grave. Hope the spring won't lag much longer. Butterflies will come in throngs. There'll be new nests on the branches and new birds will sing new songs. Although Peretz had the opposite approach to culture to the one that Luxembourg would grow up to develop, it is striking to see similarities between themes and ideas that will later appear in her letters. And here I'm quoting from a very famous letter she wrote to her friend Matilda of Rome in 1917, which both resonates and also completely contradicts this sentiment. What do you want with this theme of specific, special suffering of the Jews? I am as much connected with the poor victims of the rubber plantations of Putamio, the black people in Africa with whose corpses the Europeans play catch. I have no special place from my heart for the Jewish ghetto. I feel at home in the entire world, wherever there are clouds and birds and human tears. Rosa's internationalism shifted her from cultural emergence, yet the root of her family and place in which she has grown had remained with her to gain their own unique interpretations. She was truly sweet generous. From here, I now move for th to think about Rosa's own building and her influence as a writer. Rosa Luxemburg's writing style was as eclectic as her upbringing. She drew on Shakespearean quotes as in the uh, height of reformer revolution, she turns to Shakespeare's um, Hamlet and writes about to be or not to be. She uses Talmudic references and powerful political metaphors. I'm now going to read you a very famous segment in the context of Rosa's diverse background and use of cultural texts, the Unius brochure for 1915. Violated, dishonored, wading in blood, dripping filth, there stands bourgeoisie society. This is it in reality, not all spick and span and moral with pretense to culture, philosophy, ethics, order, peace, and the rule of law, but the ravening beast, the witch's Sabbath of anarchy, a play to culture and humanity. Thus it reveals itself in its true, its naked form. Rosa also produced cultural texts of her own, as noted and discussed widely by Helen Scott, who is my own source for many of these readings. I shall not dwell on that here. However, I shall pass to another category in which Rosa excelled in the context of her cultural forerunners, which is letter writing. One of the main problems I encountered researching and writing my book was the divide between Rosa the political personality and Rosa the woman. This divide, rooted in the long arc of sexism, which refuses to see men's private lives as worthy of study, and indeed women's public, public life worthy of study, very much harmed the legacy of Luxembourg. And surprisingly, I found spreads even to feminist circles and, of course, to male socialist circles. So many people around me who read her letters gushed over the loving Rosa while engaging little or any of her political work. Rosa's letters are indeed extraordinary in many ways. She was proud of her letter writing skills and advanced them throughout her life. We have some um, evidence that she was writing letters to her family as a young child. However, again, there's a Jewish forerunner for Rosa's talent that can shed new light on this ability and understand her more deeply. Rachel van Hegen von Enser, who incidentally this year will celebrate her 250th birthday, so another big year for another big woman, is widely considered to be the first and most eminent woman of letters in modern Jewish history. Barred from formal education, she used letter writing as a mode of self-reflection and development of a coherent philosophy. She was, amongst other things, the subject of Hannah Arendt's rehabilitation thesis, and Arendt, of course, also wrote about Luxembourg. She tried to emancipate herself from being bound to traditional structures. And here I'm reading for you a quote from Rahel. 
one is not free if one must represent something in the bourgeoisie society, a spouse, the wife of a civil servant, etc. Of course, letter writing extended existed prior to her life and work. That has truly established letter writing as a distinct practice with its own circle of correspondence and responses. In a fascinating practice of self-preservation, she published some of her letters in her lifetime. There are 6,000 letters that had survived from her archive, despite the Nazis attacking her legacy immediately after rising to power, much like they did with Luxembourg. Rosa Luxemburg is not often read with Rachel Barnhagen. They had very different attitude to life and radically different politics. However, I propose here that looking at letter writing as a distinct genre with its own rules, ethos and histories allows us to read Luxemburg's letters as both continuity with her political archive and also distinct from it. Rather than creating a divide between Red Rosa and the romantic bird laughing Rosa, we see a woman who was well-skilled and well-honed in diversity of writing methods and used them effortlessly in different contexts. We know that Rosa was aware of Rachel and her letters and she actually cites her in a footnote in her text, What is Political Economy? Thus, we gain an image of Rosa Luxemburg as, as a writer who is rich and contradictory, a legacy from which she, as, as rich and contradictory as the legacy from which she emerged, drawing on Jewish as well as non-Jewish sources, working in different genres, sometimes on the same day, and being able to use language as a powerful tool for both, both interpreting the world as well as changing it. In the final part of my talk, I'll move to considering which lessons does this cursory study leave with us today. I name this talk in, its, in itself, every book is something terribly unapproachable, which is the direct quote from one of Luxembourg's letters for three reasons. First, Rosa's own culture and literary upbringing was complex and at times contradictory. Before she had, was, had been made aware of it, her life and times placed her into reconcilable sources, which demanded she could heal them into a narrative in her own way. Second, Rosa's own work, each book or pamphlet read separately, is indeed something terribly unapproachable. Her writing is complex and often traverses different genres. Looking at each piece of writing in separation will give us a very partial image, and even a coherent image is anything but coherent. Lastly, I had found this quote from Rosa when I started working on my own book, and I felt, as a friend talking to me from beyond, that this was writing advice that was elucidated clearly about how I felt about my own book. As I moved along in the process of writing, I became more and more indebted to the work of Luxembourg scholars, some of whom I'm very pleased to be sharing this stage with today, and all of whom are the pillars on which this symposium is relying. But then I learned that I had to read many more books that I anticipated originally, that not only did I have to be very well versed in Capital Volume 2, but I also had to read Yudlamit Peretz and other authors that I had not imagined when I started on my own book. And I had to think about how they all chimed into her extraordinary life. Concluding this talk with the forward-looking impulse in the spirit of Ro Rosa's ethos, I turned to a few lessons that Rosa had taught me and her work had left with me. Rosa's personality and politics were often contradictory. She was unwavering in her integrity for the causes she supported, but she was also conflicting alliances at times, conflicting opinions in different cases that she had examined by the same vista, had um, irreconcilable irreconcilable arguments and learned to live with them. I had started writing the book trying to find answers and ended it in her spirit, learning to live at peace with questions. Whereas Rosa really was, as her friend Clara Zetkin astutely noted, the living flame of the revolution. Her cultural tastes were not often radical, but she gives a full and often conflicting idea of what it means to live the revolution. Perhaps this teaches us in turn a consequent lesson about the coherence of the revolution. We inhabit a very different world to the one in which Rosa Luxemburg lived. We have rights and freedoms she tirelessly worked for, and we have technologies she could not even imagine. Imagine what she would do with Twitter and Zoom, additive of our fingers. But it is striking to see how many questions we are facing today that can retain answers from 1871 and beyond. The conflicts between the personal and the political that Rosa Luxemburg's life had to navigate between and change guises, had but anything but disappeared. I had felt transformed by spending intimate time with Rosa. 
and I'm moved to be with you today. And so I would like to end on her words to Matilda Form in a letter from 1916. Then see that you stay human. Being human means joyfully just throwing your whole life on the scales of destiny and need be, but all the while rejoicing in every sunny day and every beautiful cloud. Ah, I know, no, I know of no formula to write to you for being human. Happy birthday, Rosa Luxemburg. Thank you for giving me daily lessons on how to be human. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dana Mites, for your fascinating presentation. This was great. And I'm very happy that Helen Scott is now with us. A warm welcome to you. Um, there was problems with the time zone, I think. I am glad that you could join us. Um, and I want to introduce her as well. Helen Scott will talk about Rosa Luxemburg's literary analysis, which addresses the importance that classical literature and the arts played in Luxemburg's writings. Helen is a professor of English literature at the Uni University of Vermont in the United States. In 2008, she edited Rosa Luxemburg's important works, Reform or Revolution and The Must Strike. She's also on the board of Versus Complete Works of Rosa Luxemburg and is a co-editor of volume five, Political Writing Three, which contains Luxemburg's writing on revolution. She's also planning to edit a future volume, which will be focused on culture and art. Welcome, glad to have you here. Um, and you can start with your presentation. Please. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia, and, and thanks to all of the organizers. And it's a great pleasure to be on this panel with my um, dear colleague, Dana, and Kate, whose work I admire so much. So Rosa Luxemburg is one of the most significant political figures of the 20th century. She developed an analysis of imperialism that apprehended not only its economic and political, but also social, cultural, and human dimensions. She resolutely opposed capitalist militarism. She was a leading theorist and strategist, and she was an activist from her first party work among miners in Upper Silesia through her speaking tours to mass crowds after the 1905 Russian Revolution to her agitation among revolutionary workers on the streets in the final days of her life. Her understanding of oppression was bolstered by personal circumstances female in an overwhelmingly male public sphere, Jewish in a climate of vicious anti-Semitism, Polish at a time when Poles suffered national oppression, and an individual who lived with a disability. All of this contributed to the unique understanding of discrimination and inequality that is manifest in her lifelong commitment to the global working class movement. And as Dana has illustrated, uh, creative literature was central to her life and work. Now this legacy should make Luxembourg a, a figure of particular interest for post-colonial literary criticism, which places questions of empire, colonization and decolonization, alterity and oppression at the heart of cultural analysis. But Luxembourg has not been a major point of reference in the field. Iranian author and literary scholar Hamid Dabashi calls her the unsung hero of post-colonial theory. He writes, by giving detailed accounts of the British economic atrocities in India and French colonialism in Algeria, Rosa Luxemburg anticipated the more detailed accounts of post-colonial theories by decades. By bringing the presumed margins of self-centering Europe to global consciousness, she enabled the post-colonial theorist a veritable voice at the worldwide gathering of critical Marxist thinking. These critical, these special qualities are at last starting to be recognized in the interdisciplinary field. This can be seen in two recent publications in English, Rosa Luxemburg, Capitalism, Imperialism and the Postcolonial, edited by Filippo Minozzi which considers the importance of Luxembourg as a global thinker, 
and the collection Creolizing Rosa Luxemburg, edited by Drusilla Cornell and Jane Anna Gordon, and launched in this conference, which explores her work through the lens of theorists and contexts of the global south. But Luxembourg's analysis of literature remains largely ignored. This might be expected in post-colonial studies, which has been heavily influenced by postmodern postmodern skepticism towards Marxism. But it is also the case more broadly in English departments. You'll not find Luxembourg in the Marxism section of a standard literary theory course. Typical candidates would include extracts from Marx, usually the Communist Manifesto, maybe some contrasting works by Lukács and Adorno, some Althusser on ideology, something by Frederick Jameson, but not Luxembourg. Now, admittedly, there is a lot left out of the academic Marxist canon. You aren't likely to see Anatoly Lunacharsky, Leon Trotsky, Franz Fanon, C.L.R. James, Claudia Jones, Benita de Parry, or many others. So this omission isn't specific to Luxembourg. And perhaps we should not be surprised by this. Luxembourg herself provided a trenchant critique of the role of the formal education system in class society. Think of her famous description of the chair of, the e chair of economics when she was a student at the University of Zurich. She, she calls him a theorizing bureaucrat who plucks apart the living material of social reality into the most minute fibers and particles, rearranges and categorizes them according to bureaucratic procedure and delivers them in this mangled state as scientific material for the administrative and legislative activity of privy councillors, a description that would fit many literary critics. Now this scorn extended to the rapidly blooming institution of literary criticism. She scoffed at a proposal from her friend Hans Diefenbach, your idea that I should write a book about Tolstoy doesn't appeal to me one bit. For whom? What for, Henshin? Everyone can read Tolstoy's books, and if the books themselves don't give off a powerful breath of life, I wouldn't succeed in doing so through literary commentary. And in the same letter she writes, I also regard, for example, the monstrous amount of Goethe literature, that is, literature about Goethe, as pure trash, and is my opinion that far too many such books have been written. So for these and many other reasons, Luxembourg studies are unlikely to be flavor of the month in the corporate university. However, Luxembourg is generally absent not only from literary theory 101 courses, but also from much more inclusive, far ranging and thoughtful studies of Marx's literary criticism. And it's really high time to correct this omission. There is much in Luxembourg's legacy that is of value and relevance, both in general, in her many political, organizational and theoretical contributions and specifically in what she had to say about literature. And although she did draw the line at that Tolstoy monograph, Luxembourg penned more than a few works of literary analysis across the span of her active writing life. Of the material that is published and currently available in English, this includes an assessment of the Polish poet Adam Miskiewicz from 1898, a review of Franz Mehring's biography of Schiller from 1905, the essay Tolstoy as Social Thinker, which first appeared in 1908, and Life of Korolenko, which she wrote in Breslau prison in 1918 and was published posthumously in 1919 as the introduction to her German translation of Vladimir Korolenko's History of My Contemporary. These collectively form an impressive counterpoint to the straw person version of Marxist literary analysis as crudely reductive. They showcase a consistent attention to aesthetic and formal issues, while also locating authors, movements and texts in their historical conditions of production and reception. Unlike a great deal of contemporary criticism, they restore what Edward Said referred to as the messier precincts of life and historical experience to studies of literature. Luxembourg's orientation on the specific value of each work is evident across the range of her political and personal writing. Whether reaching for a line from Goethe to illustrate a complex step in the reproduction of capital, 
or identifying the ability of the great Russian novels to reveal the hidden processes of the Tsarist empire, Luxembourg is acutely aware that the literary arts have a power and affect unlike any other mode of communication. She draws attention to the particular characteristics of genres and works and highlights their emotional and sensual impact. This can be seen frequently in the letters. For example, when she describes the impact of reading a verse from Goethe, it's as if with parched lips, I was sipping a delicious drink that cools my spirit and heals me body and soul. Or when she recounts the comfort she draws from the poems of Krasinski, in their sound, they are the purest music. I read them mostly for their tone and color. Or comparing the comedic possibilities of George Bernard Shaw's The Philanderers to Shakespeare. It wafts into one's face the giggly hobgoblin of a Midsummer Night's Dream. And in the formal literary criticism too, contra the oft repeated claim that Marxist criticism is by definition reductive, the formal and emotional specificity of each work is primary. As Subaranjan Dasgupta writes in his lovely 2009 work, Rosa Luxemburg's Critique of Creativity and Culture, Luxemburg emphasizes one of the basic tenets of enlightened Marxian aesthetics. Artistic engagement or literary production always enjoys a high degree of autonomy. At the same time, Luxembourg traces the relationships between cultural production and the shifting balance of class forces. She both looks to creative literature for particular historical insights and turns to history to understand artistic developments. And there is nothing reductive or mechanical about this method. Rather, we are given nuanced and specific analyses of the reciprocal push and pull between socio-historical forces and the cultural developments that are shaped by and in turn shape them. One of the finest examples is her account of the poet Adam Miskevich. In the 1898 essay, she calls him, a master at once of lyric and epic, both the bard of national love and yearning and the objective portrayer of the nation's past. She locates the source of this power in the historical convulsions that gave rise to romanticism. A new intelligentsia was born out of the 1831 popular revolt against Tsarism, and this formed the basis for the romanticism that displaced the derivative classicism that had previously held sway. She writes, while the classicists could offer only shelf upon shelf of a grey mass of mediocrities and soulless manipulators of form, Romanticism, overnight as it were, conjured up whole constellations of glittering young talent from the womb of society. And as the most brilliant star of this dawn twilight, the mighty genius of Adam Miskevich arose in the firmament of Polish literature. Revolutionary social forces gave rise to fresh artistic vision and formal innovation. But as is suggested in that paradoxical phrase, dawn twilight, this brilliance was short lived and quote, soon after the rising was defeated, the nightingale of Polish nationalism fell silent. His last major work, Master Thaddeus or Pan Thaddeus was the last great monument to Polish nationalism. Luxembourg thus sees creative literature's potential to be a repository for revolutionary struggle. In her review of Mehring's biography, she writes of the emancipatory possibilities of Schiller's poetry and locate, locates this firmly in the working class movement. Schiller's role in the intellectual growth of the revolutionary proletariat in Germany is not so much rooted in what he himself imported into the working class struggle for emancipation through the content of his poems, but rather the reverse. It consists in what the revolutionary working class deposited in Schiller's poems based on its own worldview, its striving and its feelings. This connection between revolutionary social change and cultural innovation is the major theme of her life of Korolenko, which situates the great 19th century Russian novel within changing conditions under Tsarism. She writes, the chief characteristic of this sudden emergence of Russian literature is that it was born out of opposition to the Russian regime, out of the spirit of struggle. 
Russian literature became under Tsarism a power in public life as in no other country and in no other time. It remained at its post for a century until it was relieved by the material power of the masses when the word became flesh. Luxembourg traces the multi-stranded and complex ways that revolutionary struggle gives rise to artistic movements and writers, which in turn can nurture and inspire further struggles. She writes of Korolenko's Legend of Floris, like a refreshing breeze, this defiant creed stormed through the deep fog of indolism, indolence and mysticism. Korolenko was ready for the new historic violence in Russia, which soon was to lift its beneficent arm, the arm to work and fight for liberty. Luxembourg holds together this sense of literature's liberatory potential with an awareness of culture is both a product of and constrained by class society. In the 1903 essay, Stagnation and Progress of Marxism, she writes, in every class society, intellectual culture, science and art is created by the ruling class. And the aim of this culture is in part to secure the direct satisfaction of the needs of the social process, and in part to satisfy the mental needs of the members of the governing class. In the 1908 discussion of Tolstoy, she returns to this question. For Tolstoy, she explains, art, contrary to all aesthetic and philosophical scholastic opinions, is not a luxury product for releasing feelings of beauty, joy or the like in beautiful souls, but an important historical form of social communication, like language, between people. This understanding leads to what she calls a genuinely materialist and historical criterion and identification of the class character of art. She writes, ever since society has been split into a great exploited mass and a small ruling minority, art only serves to express the feelings of the rich and leisurely minority. Luxembourg departs with Tolstoy, however, because his model is static lacking any concept of the working class as agent of change and failing to grasp the fluidity of culture and class society. Luxembourg instead depicts the realm of culture as a political and ideological battleground produced by and reinforcing the brutal tectonics of capitalism, but also exposing and opposing that same system. The great Russian novels show that Permanent oppression, insecurity, injustice, poverty and dependence, as well as that division of labor which leads to one-sided specialization, mold people in a certain manner. And it is just the peculiar psychological abnormality, the warped development of the human soul under the influence of everyday social conditions, which aroused writers like Gogol, Dostoevsky and others. She writes, Dostoevsky's novels are furious attacks on bourgeois society in whose face he shouts, the real murderer, the murderer of the human soul is to you. While attuned in this way to the utopian and subversive potential of fiction and always interested in authors' backgrounds, Luxembourg knows how to separate the artwork from the artist. She notes that many of the great Russian novelists were mystics or reactionaries, and she wonderfully says of Tolstoy that his creative power is so strong that he himself is incapable of botching his own works. She opposed any tendentious uses of art, dismissing Polish socialists who, quote, try at all costs to derive evidence from Miskiewicz's writings for his socialist views. Ultimately, she writes, Patterns such as revolutionary or progressive in themselves mean very little in art. Socialists do not need political cover for appreciating art. It is valuable in its own right, but its potential cannot be realized under capitalism. She concludes, the utmost the working class can do today is to safeguard bourgeois culture from the vandalism of the bourgeois reaction and create the social conditions requisite for free cultural development. Now Luxembourg preceded both the advent of mass culture and the explosion of post-colonial literature, itself the product of mass struggles for liberation by the colonized that transformed the so-called Western canon 
and continues to fire imaginations across the globe. Yet her dialectical approach to culture is nonetheless pertinent to contemporary debates. Over 20 years ago, Edward Said identified in much ostensibly radical literary criticism, what he called, quote, an unadmitted dichotomy between two kinds of politics. One, the politics defined by political theory from Hegel to Louis Althusser and Ernest Bloch, and two, the politics of struggle and power in the everyday world. It remains the case that literary conferences and journals prioritize the first type while neglecting the second. And yet there is a competing impetus that can be seen in current calls to decolonize English departments, such as that issued by Kimberly Coles, Kim Hall and Ayanna Thompson last year, in response to white supremacist appropriation of medieval and early modern literature. They argue that literary scholars have to confront the blood and violence that made English literature possible. They write, the colonial project is stitched in and through the language and literatures of the pre and early modern periods. The politics and economics that ultimately produced settler colonialism, chattel slavery, the forced migration of peoples and the development of the British empire animate these early English texts. Luxembourg's work can productively put, be put in conversation with these initiatives. She explores the realm of literature as a political battleground, both reflecting and straining against the enslavement, exploitation, violence and suffering that form the precondition for its origins and continued development. Further, she understood that imperialism is inextricably central to capitalism, and that revolutionary struggle is a precondition for the free cultural development of the oppressed. This allows, to quote Edward Said again, the restoration to works and interpretations of their place in the global setting, a restoration that can only be accomplished by an appreciation not of some tiny defensively constituted corner of the world, but of the large many windowed house of culture as a whole. Given how much of the archive remains unpublished, it is certain that the complete works of Rosa Luxemburg project will unearth and increase availability of more of the literary commentary, along with writings about culture and the arts more broadly. Hopefully, this will help restore Luxemburg to the world of Marxist literary criticism, and most importantly, to current and future struggles for a different world. Thank you very much, Helen Scott. This was amazing. Um, I just want to point out that we are live right now and our viewers have the opportunity to ask questions um, in the comments column. We will come back to these questions after these presentations. And finally, we are delighted to present Kate Evans. The floor is yours so to speak hi hello everyone oh those, those were great presentations dana and helen they were just packed with quotes i hadn't read before and things i haven't read of rosa luxemburg so this is going to be good but um i'm going to share my screen here um i've created just a little rundown on how i went about the process of creating a graphic biography of rosa luxemburg and probably one of the most important factors in that is I had to absorb as much information about Luxembourg as I could, but then I had to compress it down into as few words as possible, which is quite a specific kind of task. I was initially meant to write a book that was only meant, to, I was only paid to write 80 pages for the whole of Rosa Luxembourg's life. Um, what I managed to do was 180 pages. That was as, as short as I managed to get it. Um, and I knew nothing about Luxembourg when I came to the project. I'd received this email from Paul Bull, um, who is dedicating his retirement to creating graphic biographies um, in comics form of various different radical figures. And he sent me an email and it said, would you be interested in writing, uh, in drawing or maybe writing as well, a graphic biography of Rosa Luxembourg? 
And I basically thought, oh, Luxembourg, that's one of those groovy, groovy people whose names I've heard, like Emma Goldman, but I didn't actually know anything about her. Um, so I answered the email and said yes. Um, and then I Googled who she was and I found this image here and I was immediately intrigued. I mean, I'm going to be talking about the process of my written word arriving of, of a biography of Luxembourg, but also um, I it's also very much about the images of Luxembourg. And this is just an iconic picture of her. She basically looks like she's a Berlin squatter girl from the 1980s. Although as my partners pointed out, that's possibly actually Berlin squatter girls in the 1980s decided to look like Rosa Luxembourg. So the way that I went around the process was I read as much of Luxembourg's writings as I could in translation into English. Um, I mean, I don't speak German, in a way, I'm glad that I don't, because in this point, some editing had already been done of what was available to me. I'm really glad that the project is underway with Verso Books to create a really comprehensive archive of Luxembourg's writing, but also personally quite happy that I didn't have to read all of it <laughs> to then condense down into 180 pages. And again, of course, with those 180 pages, you're only really getting 12 sentences to a page. Um, so I read her letters. This was a good starting point. I started reading her economic writing. I went back and refreshed all my writing, my readings of Marx, so that I kind of, that seemed to be quite an essential, yeah, and then I went back and read her economic writings again. I had a look at the extant English-speaking biographies at the time, and, um, and then I dropped quite a few of them because they were rubbish. Um, Dana has really, um, filled an important gap in the English market by bringing out her recent critical biography of Luxembourg's life and work. This one at the top here, A Rebel's Guide to Rosa Luxembourg, is also really good. But I'd find that the three main biographies that I was being referred to were all fundamentally quite flawed. Um, the best of the three is Froelich's, Rosa Luxemburg. He's a student of Luxemburg. He gives an interesting account of the political st struggles that she was involved with of the day, but her personal life was completely missing from this book. Um, J.P. Nettle em embodied slightly of the worst aspects of a historian for historian's sake, in that he would, he would, um, he would recount the struggles which Luxembourg was involved with and then he'd say well why doesn't she just compromise her ideas and go along with what the majority think and you go because she actually has political principles thank you Nettle and then Ettinger who seemed to have taken a sort of a personal and psychoanalytical kind of connection to Rosa Luxembourg to the extent of as far as I can see just making stuff up about her, I found her really quite an unreliable narrator. So I was really pleased to be able to go back to the letters here and use that as the foundation of the work. I mean, Luxembourg has left so much, so much writing that speaks so directly to us. I think we don't have to, um, as I say, don't have to invent anything there. So I didn't know how to create a graphic biography. Nobody told me how to do it. So I sort of felt my way into the process. So I read all the writings of her that I could, and then I went back and I took the PDF of the letters of Rosa Luxemburg and I started to pull, I approached it in quite an organic way of deconstructing her life, pulling quotes out and arranging them thematically. So this is part of the, um, of the research that I put on my computer here. And you can see I've got some that are um, everything different quotes that I could find about the mass strike from her letters and elsewhere in her work. I grouped them together in one place and text about imperialism. I made a word document for that. But as well as that, I found I had little, little insights, little glimpses from her letters into her physicality, for example. So I take out a little quote and put this in this file that says physical details, which is, I shake you warmly by the hand. I was like, right, okay. So she shakes people warmly by the hand that's something that shows who she is in physical space. And because I'm approaching this from a, from a visual way, I, I want those little details. There's a lovely little quote in her letters where she describes herself 
trying in vain to get her coat down from a coat hook and, and cursing my Lilliputian stature. She's, there she is, she's really short in a world made for tall people. Um, I took some of her love letters, I took some of her prison writings. So I pulled it all apart. And then this was, her, oh yeah. So here, for example, are some of the quotes of, of I'm just here specifically interested in Mimi, her cat. Yesterday, Lenin came, and up to today, he's been here four times already. I enjoy talking with him. He's clever and well-educated and has such an ugly mug, the kind I like to look at. Poor Mimi keeps going kuru. She impressed Le Lenin tremendously. He said that only in Siberia had he seen such a magnificent creature, that she was a majestic cat. She also flirted with him, rolled on her back and behaved enticingly toward him. When he tried to approach her, she whacked him with a paw and snarled like a tiger. Again, we've got a sense of physicality. We've got the sense of people who, to me, are only ever, you know, historical characters as real lived people, these little slices of life. And I would love to just draw a cartoon about just this one little encounter. Unfortunately, the method effort of trying to get some semblance of all of the events of her life into such a short period of time is that I ended up editing these out all the way through and, and I would love to go back and make a film script about Luxembourg because you would have the ability to just put them all back in again. Um, so this is when, uh, this is my first draft of the book, it's very much an attempt to just get, just to piece together a um, a, a sequence of all the things in her life and then as I go through I then start adding these quotes in, uh, in into the sequence and it's it's not the case that I would take a quote and uh, the quotes of her work and run them through chronologically I've could example find some lovely recollections in her later prison letters which show what it was like for her in her younger days even before she left home um, and then I bring my own writing to the project and um, this is just the page where I'm trying to work out how I will portray her assassination and it's a really crucial part of the book. You see I'm not just interested in showing the events of Luxembourg's life or the major themes of her work, I'm also interested in constructing a narrative that will hold the reader. So I find the most dramatic representation of events that is consistent with the truth. Um, so here she is at the point where she's being arrested and I, and I came up with the phrase, do you think that 47 is old enough to die? If you do, you must be very young. Here she is being pulled away by the Freikorps. I must say, it's an absolute gift to the cartoonist, the fact that the Freikorps went around with skulls on the fronts of their vehicles and clothes, it makes it quite easy to turn them into the baddies. And then she raged after the rifle butt slammed her into semi-consciousness, she summoned the last ounce of her strength for her final order, don't shoot, but they did. And again, when you're writing a comic, you have to get it down to the minimum number of words. So that's summoning the last of her strength after the rifle butt slammed her into semi-consciousness, she gave her final order. So that's just how to arrive at the text. I then have to look at the pictures. Some of these are pictures that I'm, I'm creating a dramatic representation of events. So this is one page. Uh, so all the source pages here, we're, we're leaving so these were all the, the folders that I created for the different the different events in her life and the different themes of them. Um, I won't go into how incredibly huge the First World War folders are because I just went down a rabbit hole when it came to First World War picture research and then emerged two weeks later with pictures of rats in people's skulls. So this is drafting um, Luxembourg's departure from Warsaw, um, and this is a contemporary um, steam engine. So leaving Warsaw, this is page 23. These are all the pictures that I used to create this picture here. These, here they are, all of them. Here's the train, here's the people, here's the carriage. And then here we've got Luxembourg's parents and they were real people and we can see them here. So I make them a bit older, but keep the same kind of face shape. And here she is 
and I've got two contemporary photos and this hat's made its appearance here for her. And so here we have the pencil artwork and I had to create the whole book in pencil form, put the words on and then go back and then do the whole thing again in ink. And then after you've done it all in ink, you have to put it in, <laughs> put it into Photoshop. Um, and so I really enjoyed the kind of the, the kind of detail and the kind of texture that you get in creating a historical novel. I also wanted to play about with the art form as much as I could to create something that had literary merit in its own right. Um, so here it, here's just our first glimpse of Luxembourg. I wanted to locate the book very firmly at starting at the birth of Luxembourg and I relate that to events in Paris Commune that are happening around the same time and ending with the death of Luxembourg. The brief had been to then also talk about her legacy and oh my god I was already really struggling to get everything into that number of pages but also I felt that what other people then made of Luxembourg isn't actually relevant to the specific story of the events of her life because everyone will have a relationship to Luxembourg. Um, so here she is as a baby and if you look at the last image of her in the book I make of as she's in the in the Landwehr Canal, I created this uh, visual kind of echo. As there's a way that you can make uh, visual metaphors in a comic book in the same way that uh, a writer could create, uh, you know, metaphors using words. I'd say that Alison Bechdel's book Fun Home is an excellent example of this. She creates pictures that work in a literary way, and I was. It was fun trying to do that with, with this story. So I'm gonna have a little flick through um, some of the portraits of Luxembourg. So I had all the photos of Luxembourg and I put them all up around my studio as I worked. And then she would be looking down at me and then I would be drawing sex scenes of her. And then I would be thinking, oh my God, she's looking at me doing this. <laughs> But I tried to, every time I found another picture of Luxembourg, I tried to incorporate them in the book. So at this point, she's saying, the revolution is, the revolution is prostatic, alles anderes ist Clark. I think that's what she's saying. Um, the revolution is everything, all else is soft cheese. Strange quote, but yeah, uh, translated as all else is bilge by Verso. Um, and I wanted to, as well as giving her this, uh, I'm not showing her, as proclaiming it like a great statement. I'm just showing her hanging out with her friend. So I've taken this picture of her with Clara Setkin and then I've shown them both together, showing their friendship and also squeezing this very good quote in. Here she is as the, uh, as the, um, in, um, yeah, so here, here she is talking to the crowds. Okay, so I'm probably drawing slightly quickly to the end of, of the of the thing. Uh, oh, I did say this was going to happen. I did say my brain was going to stop working at some point. Give me a drink of water. I, this is menopause, guys. So, um, so this is how I'm using the comics form to bring her work to life and I wasn't just interested in talking about what Rosa Luxemburg did or who she had relationships with or who her friends were I wanted to bring her work to the fore of what I was doing and I was uniquely placed to do this because I've previously written a book about climate change I've written a comic book about climate change again it's quite hard to create comics about climate change but I came up with this idea of using visual metaphors to illustrate the processes of climate change and then I took that over and it, with this current book used it to talk bring metaphors into showing how economics works so at this point Luxembourg is talking about the precariousness of the worker and I came up with this idea of a dandelion clock perhaps you will ask is not submission to the vagaries of the market a small price to pay for individual freedom Alas, how unfree is this worker here? The distinctive feature of capitalism is the precariousness of the worker. 
The capitalist controls the means of production. The worker has nothing. The only commodity he can sell is his labor power. And the entire process revolves around the exploitation of that labor. The worker may think himself free, but what choice does he have other than to sell his labor? Jobs are scarce and insecure for the capitalist keeps a reserve army of the unemployed ready at his bidding. The capitalist certainly considers himself free, but what choice does he have but to press his workforce ever harder, driving up his profit, for if he doesn't swim ahead of the competition, he will sink. All humanity groans with frightful suffering under the yoke of a blind social power, capital, that it has un self unconsciously created. The underlying purpose of every form of social production, the satisfaction of society's needs, is turned completely on its head. Production is no longer for the sake of people. Production for the sake of profit becomes the law all over the earth. And this was one of the wonderful things about the book is that so much of Luxembourg's writings is brilliant, but it is also very dense and there are also pages and pages and pages of it. And you can find a paragraph like this in her writing, but it will be bookended by another 30 pages either side. So to be able to pull these quotes out and to give them space on the page, to be able to speak their full power was a really wonderful project to be able to bring to life. And here I am unashamedly making her into an icon. I, I just want to mention, since we're talking about the, since the letters of Rosa Luxemburg were so um, central to my work, I also just want to just give a little shout out to um, the, uh, to the opera, letters from a letter from Rosa Luxemburg. So this is done by Leonard Lehrman and sung by Helene Williams. And I've been ill for the past three years. And when I was at my absolute illest, this is Leonard and Helene coming to my house to sing me an opera. So <laughs> um, Leonard has made his own translation of Luxembourg from the original German and created this lovely operatic piece about it. So please, if you're a lover of culture about Luxembourg, then please do check it out. It's on YouTube. It's called A Letter from Rosa Luxembourg by Leonard Lehrman. Um, Thank you very much for um, for uh, your attendance. Although, of course, this is Zoom, so you could have just put it on pause and gone and made coffee. But um, I'm really very thankful to be here. Thank you very much, Kate Evans, <clears throat> for your for your extremely interesting lecture. That was amazing. I would like to say a big thanks to all our speakers again and to my English teacher, Darren. Um, now we have some minutes left to take questions from the audience. Maybe uh, you have some questions among yourselves. But before we do that, I would like to raise a glass to Rosa Luxemburg. It's her birthday today, together with you. I have a bottle, then I have a bottle. I have to open it now. And I think uh, it's good to celebrate the birthday with champagne, isn't it? <laughs> um, you hear that? <laughs> So happy birthday, Rosa Luxemburg. Happy birthday, Rosa Luxemburg. Happy birthday, Rosa Luxemburg. Happy birthday, Rosa Luxemburg. You do realize if the fry call hadn't killed her, she'd be 150 now. 150, yes. Yeah. <laughs> In Hebrew, you sing like happy birthday, may you live till 120. So like she's already done that. She's ahead of her <laughs> birthday song. Mm. So now we came to the questions. I have a comment um, in the Facebook chat from Leonard Lehrmann. He wrote, Rosa as a reader should also cover her amazing grasp or of a commentary on Russian literature. For example, Korolenko, but this you said already, Helen. Oh, could, I, could I come back at that? Because that was during my talk. Uh, okay. Thank you for that comment. I wrote about Rosa and Korolenko extensively, and I very much draw on Helen's work. Um, as I said in the beginning of my talk, my focus was specifically on certain cultural influences, both within her own texts and her cultural, cultural backgrounds that are not usually researched. And I had actually coordinated with Helen before uh, our talk, and we decided we would do a division of labor. 
So <laughs> I am very aware of a reading of Korolenko. I start my biography with that text and I end my biography on that text. But um, because we knew that we had a focus that tried to overlap, we tried to also divide our focus between that. But beyond this very pragmatic um, answer, I do want to say that it is really interesting how in all um, research on Rosa, there is so little done on her Jewish cultural background, which is why I turned to that. And I'm very much indebted to the work of Rory Castle Jones, who explored and unearthed a lot of materials that hadn't been discussed before. And I think that it's very easy to look at the very explicit references she makes. And I think that's something that we do and we like doing. But looking at her histories that she doesn't reference, but are there between the lines, whether it's using terms like the witch's Sabbath and whether it's drawing on Talmudic terms, which she rephrases in terms in different texts, you do learn about elements of her upbringing that are there, are part of who she is, just as much as she explicitly talks about Goethe and Korolenko and Tolstoy. So I think there's a little bit of liter literary work of a different kind that I'm trying to do that looks at different influences that again, and not usually discussed and are just as central to who she is as other elements are. But thank you for the comment. I'm just coming straight back to you, Dana. I'm so pleased that you're bringing that appreciation to her work because I've had people say to me, oh, but she was an assimilated Jew and oh, but she wouldn't speak Yiddish. I'm like, what? <laughs> and I'm not Jewish. So it's not something that I could, there were no nuances there that I could explore, but I was explicitly wanted to put you know, her her um, representations of her in the great synagogue of Warsaw into the book because I wanted to ground her as a Jewish woman. And it was something that I could only really bolt together. It wasn't something that was coming from a personal knowledge. So I'm really pleased to see academic engagement with that because I think there's quite an anti-Semitic tendency to deny it as well. So thank you, Kate, for that. And I think, you know, I, I did draw a lot on your reading but I should also say that Luxembourg has descendants who are alive and well. One of them is a family friend. And, um, you know, like many Polish Jews, they're scattered around the world and um, they have different relationships to their Judaism and culture. And I have to say, I'm Jewish. And when I came to write about Rosa, I identified a lot of the communion within my own family. And, um, there's a lot of attempts to read her as either self-hating Jew or as denying her Jewishness. And indeed she wrote in the edition, she corresponded, she corresponded with many Jewish leaders of her time. But I think there's something really unique in which you really can't put her in boxes in the same way that I, I really rely on your reading of her gender identity, such as you can't really read her as a proto-feminist because she wasn't in many ways, but she was still independent minded and radical in many ways. And Again, it's, it's very complicated and you can't put it in one category and say she was an anti-X or she was pro-Y, but she had all these contradictions that she could hold very efficiently within her, which was really important to me. So thank you for, for your legacy that I incorporated into my reading. In the Kayam was also many compliments for your lectures. Um, and also Leonard Lehmann uh, wrote like he liked uh, including not only German but also Polish and Russian lit literature. This is also a comment. And Iftach want to know can we have a link to Helen Scott's paper, please? Thank you, Helen. <laughs> Maybe you can put it after in the Kayam. And there is a question to Kate from Aneta. Did you see the movie of Margarete von Trotta? Did you have been inspired by this film? Do you want to answer directly? Yeah, I mean, I have seen the film. Um, there is a case that when I approach an artistic project, I sometimes try to avoid things that too closely, uh, that, go that are going to, influence what I'm going to do too directly like I would I would maybe not want to I maybe wouldn't want to watch the film straight away in case I would felt that I wanted to copy it so I, I definitely got the whole script down first um, and then I watched the film there are things about it that I like there are things about it that really annoy me I mean I think it's such a shame that when people make artistic uh, get actresses to play Luxembourg that they should be it would be really nice if they were visually Semitic because she did attract anti-Semitism 
partly because it was obvious that she was Jewish. And so I think getting a blonde, blue haired actress to play Luxembourg is missing an aspect of, of her way of being in the world that is actually quite historically important. I mean, the rise of anti Semitism, uh, the, Hitler, fascism, the fact that they hated Jewish people because they viewed Jewish people as being Marxist and viewed the German revolution as being the stab in the back that brought them out of the First World War. There's a really clear system of events and the fact that Rosa is Jewish, Dr Luxembourg is Jewish is important. I also found that some of the ways in which um, von Trotter um, dramatizes the her relationship with um, Yorgish's were just, I just felt missed the mark. And what I wanted to show was that she was a woman who had the confidence to say, I'm t I have the right to do this because I'm 10 times better than you directly to Yorgish's. And I felt that von Trotter's um, representation of her was very much like, oh, Leo, will you give me babies? And I was like, that annoyed me, okay? But I then subsequently was really gutted because I discovered that they, quite a lot of the interior scenes had been set in Luxembourg's actual apartment. If I'd known that, I would so have gone back there and used those for source material. So maybe I should have paid a bit closer attention. Um, can I interject something, Julia? Yes, sure. Please, Helen Scott. Um, I, Kate, another thing about that movie, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm very um, attached to the movie. It's, it's beautiful and moving, but it's also kind of relentlessly bleak. You know, it focuses on the, um, her, her time in, in prison and, and her murder, um, which obviously is an important part of Luxembourg's story. But one of the things that's so lovely about Red Rosa is that you also give us the vibrancy and the joy and the sense of beauty, you know, that, that is also so much part of Luxembourg's life when you read not only her personal letters, but her public work, you get that sense of this is this is why you're a socialist, right? Because of the, you want that sense of joy and beauty and vibrancy to, to be a, available to everybody. You know, it's, it's like realizing the potential of life that capitalism constantly tamps down and, and destroys. And, and I love that you capture that about her. Um, the thing, the question that I had for you, Kate, was when I first read the complete letters, you know, you, you feel like you're getting a, a window uh, onto the world of this incredible person. But also I often felt like I shouldn't be seeing this because it was so personal and I, just didn't get a sense that Luxembourg would want those most intimate moments to be out there for everybody to see. And I, I on, on the other hand, I do firmly believe that the personal is political and I'm not a fan of, of rigid separation. So I wonder, Kate, how you negotiated that, whether you had some of the same feelings sometimes of how much are you going to expose? Um. Well, I'm create, I created a dramatic character who was based on Luxembourg. And when I first started writing the, the thing, I, I was amazed to find that I sort of had a film of it playing in my head. I could see all these things in my mind's eye of, of, of what she was doing. Um, so I did do a, a fictional creation in order to bring her life to work, in order to bring her work to work. I think... I think if I was just doing it about who she shags and where she went and, and how bright every cloud is, then I wouldn't have felt the artistic justification for it. But because I was also using the book to tear apart um, Marxist capital and to put the main themes from an introduction to political economy and accumulation of capital and, and reform or revolution, all these ideas, the fact that I was able to create snapshots of the themes of her work in the way that was accessible to people, I felt like it was okay, this kind of like character that I was creating because it would then lead people on to a greater understanding of Luxembourg. It would lead them on to a greater appreciation of her, of not just the events of her life, but the meaning of her work. I think the fact that her work is there is what gives me the justification. It's a really interesting question because I'm currently 
trying to put something together on another um, political figure and they're still alive. And I want to try and create a political biography of somebody who is a living person and where that boundary comes between a personal representation and a, a focus on a person in political events that are out in the public domain, it's really complicated. It's really difficult. It's, it's easier when you're creating a work about something that you've directly experienced yourself. When you're, create, when you're inventing an imaginary world or trying to recreate a historical world, it's, uh, it's tough to know what is justified and what is gratuitous. But hey, I do it better than Hollywood. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have another qu question to Kate. Um, from Elfie Padovan. I'm greeting you because uh, she is a peace activist from Munich. And she wants to know, dear Kate Evans, the last photo, hasn't it been Claude, Claude Luxembourg from behind, the cousin, cousin of Rosa Luxembourg, who lived in England. <laughs> but, um, I'm confused by this one. The last photo was the one of her giving a speech to the crowds. I don't know which photo it is. Um, oh, it's a shame we've lost Donna because she's much better on all of Luxembourg's extended family. <laughs> Again, I have to focus just down on the one character throughout it. And, and a criticism that has been made of my book is that it makes Luxembourg seem self-centered. And the reason why it does that is because almost all the conversations that she has within the comic are, hi, I'm Luxembourg. I, I make this impassionate and, and important political statement. And then another character comes along and says, yes. And then goes, yes, and now I'll talk about myself a bit more. So again, I don't really get to widen the focus out and we don't really get to meet Leo Yorkishes as a person in his own right, or Kostya Zetkin or, or, or Louis Kautsky. Or, or Clara Zetkin, none of them are really given equal space on the page. And that is purely just because I didn't have a lot of space on the page. Thank you again. Um, I have another comment. Could you please send the link of your conference to Pauline Museum in Warsaw? There are the discussion planified for the 18 March about Rosa Luxemburg in Polish contest. Yes, we, we can do or you can do because the link you will find in um, Facebook and also in YouTube um, after some time. And there is another comment, Leonard Lehrmann, Kate, the Frank, nudie and sexually in your drawing, you told me was one of the fun aspects of your creation and in certainly comes across that way. So it's so, a so comment, maybe you want to say something to that? Yeah, I could mention that I've worked out that all my previous boyfriends made it into the book. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I just looked back over the representations and went, oh my god, I know who I've drawn there. <laughs> they don't know. <laughs> and um, I, mean, I have, yes. It certainly is fun. I mean, always what's fun for a cartoonist is, is being able to draw something different, being able to draw something new. And so I, I found all aspects of it were refreshingly different. And, and I have a question to... Helen, what do you think are the most relevant aspects of Luxembourg's political vision today? To Helen. Well, I would have to say socialism from below, self-emancipation of the oppressed and you know on an international level so her globalism and her apprehension of the centrality of of imperialism to capitalism that you can't separate those two that you can't separate militarism from capitalism um, i think that that global dimension combined with the utter certainty that emancipation can only come from the act self-organizing and activity of the oppressed themselves it's not something that can be delivered from on high and that seems to me very very relevant today 
and as important as ever. I've got a really quick reply on the same thing. Please. Um, it's, it's not Luxembourg's idea, but she popularised it. She's quoting Karl Kautsky. Is socialism or barbarism? Because we're facing the same situation where the material conditions are that for the majority of working people, life is getting harder and harder. And that is feeding directly into the rise of the far right. And we're watching the US Republican Party becoming a blatantly fascist party. Um, and people need to understand that we have got barbarism down the road or we've got socialism and we have to make a choice for one or the other. The center does not hold. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank our speakers for their time and enthusiasm. We are finished now um, this panel. The Rosa Luxemburg Foundation birthday celebration will of course continue. Our next panel will be about Rosa Luxemburg's political thinking in today's context. All further information can be found on our website rosalux.de and please also have a look at the new Rosa Luxemburg website rosaluxemburg.org. References to the books of the speakers you can find in the comment column and now I wish everyone a great next panel. Take care and stay healthy. Goodbye.